If you are new to the channel, welcome. If you are a returning viewer, however, you probably know that I mostly play in best of three, but I do have a plethora of videos that are playing best of one as well many of the other channels that i see out there on youtube play almost 100 percent in best of one and if you want to be a well-rounded magic the gathering player i think that that is a mistake and we are going to get into that in just a moment now i understand why other channels play mostly best of one. First off, you only have to think about a 60 card deck. You don't have to worry about a sideboard and wonder what the weaknesses of said deck will be. You are mostly trying to come up with a combo, surprise your opponent and win the game. That's where best of one is strongest. Best of one players have the element of surprise on their hand. If I were to take this deck into the arena, and I know this is not the best deck in the world, but it is a deck that can surprise some folks in a best of one scenario only. That is where the strength of best of one is. It's easier to construct the deck and you don't have to think about overall weaknesses if you have surprise as an element on your side. Now, I've played a lot of best of one with things like the Gruel aggro deck where I'm just trying to get damage off as fast as humanly possible or the artisan muffin man deck where I am just trying to grow artifacts as fast as possible and end the game. The problem with this deck though in best of three is that there are weaknesses to it and we are going to talk about why i play best of three first off let's talk about events i've been playing events lately because they've been giving me a well above average returns um if you don't like these events you don't have to play them but think about it this way you go into a match like this and you are faced with a bad matchup in best of one, there's nothing you could do about a bad matchup. But, and what we will get to in just a moment, there are things that you could do in best of three to make sure that your odds of winning are well above 50%, even in a matchup that doesn't quite suit your liking. If you look at a lot of the decks that I have built for best of three like let's say the most recent rendition of my azorius tokens deck if you watched the video thank you for joining on that one but it's, it's a really fun deck it's really really good in fact like this main board here is fantastic we're running things like spirited companion we're running into things like takasia's welcome wedding announcements adelines and invasion of new phyrexia we have a lot of tools in this deck uh, that, that that could do a lot of things for us even Elish Norn even if we have to blow up our own side of the board because the opponent is getting too dangerous we can do that fairly easily with Elish Norn then have an Elish Norn on the battlefield and a Mondrake against all of the opponent's nothingness but you know that that's a good best of one deck it, it wins a lot of the time but what happens when the opponent has too many creatures or too much removal or board wipes for god's sake uh, almost anything that can get in this deck's way anything like that any kind of board wipes any kind of control build is going to absolutely destroy this deck and that is why we actually come to bear with a sideboard we have the negates we have the essence scatters of uh, four negates actually in the sideboard lauren of the third pass if they have a lot of artifacts that they are using lauren comes and does her job if we are having trouble keeping things on the battlefield and the opponent has a decent enough board state we can always white sun's twilight if they're doing graveyard shenanigans we got a farewell down here the sideboard's main purpose is to fill in gaps to your deck and if you can if you notice with this deck specifically uh, which is why i chose to start talking with this deck um it doesn't have to be expensive yeah we have these rares here uh, farewell and these rares here but really these are 
pretty staply cards, so crafting those can never be a bad thing if you're playing a lot of white. Um, but you don't have to have rares down in here. You can literally have a bunch of commons and uncommons that are going to be your control pieces if you don't want to put them into your main board. If you think you can win without the control pieces, but then you're faced with a matchup where you need those control pieces, in best of three, you have that opportunity. There are a lot of matches that I went into, even with this particular deck, where the first match, after turn five or six, I just scoop it up because I know I can't win. There is that time in magic uh, with each and every match where you know you've either won or you have not won. And you scoop it up, you put the control pieces in here that you need in order to contend in the second round, then you take game two and you take game three. That has happened so many times with this because a lot of people actually do not buy build sideboards right. Take a look at an example of what a good best of one deck is and then we'll go back over to the best of three one more time and we'll discuss it there. Burn it down. If you notice, a lot of my artisan builds, a lot of my artisan decks are very much so best of one. Why? Because we're trying to surprise the opponent. We're trying to get in and out of these matches fast. Claim the firstborn. And where is it? Ah, collateral damage. I built this deck around the idea of having claimed the firstborn, gain control of a target creature with mana value three or less, untap that creature for one this is phenomenal and then collateral damage you sack a creature deal three damage to any target right if the opponent sees this once it's for first off it is fantastic in best of one because you get the gain control of that early game creature that's supposed to stabilize the board for your opponent say like a thalia or something uh you take control of it you swing with it you deal damage with it you sacrifice it you deal three damage to any other target killing either another creature or doing three to the face generally that's enough to actually kill the opponent in best of one that is phenomenal but in best of three pushback is going to kill it um, almost anything is going to get rid of that combination because even if you gain control of this and they murder that creature immediately you're stuck with a collateral damage in your hand and the opponent could be sideboarding pieces that allowed this combination not to happen uh, as often as I would like it to happen. So that's why this is strictly like a best of one try to rush your opponent down deck. Now, let's look at another aggro build that I have for best of three. Still probably my favorite deck i'm taking this into historic events right now and probably going to come out with a video on it if you guys would like to see that but this deck right here is a fantastic best of three deck and on the surface all it does is makes small artifacts really big with all that glitters and Mashiko's Reign of Truth. That's all it really does on the surface. But when you dig into the sideboard, this is where the true magic of this deck happens. We have counter spells in here. If the opponent is playing a control deck, we're going to be wanting to run these metallic rebukes. But we don't want them in the main board because we cannot use Loris of the Dream Den if we do have these in the main board. So we don't have any control at all if we want to use Loris as our companion, but I do. So I'm gonna play these pieces in the sideboard. Same with the glass caskets, which gives us a little bit more control. Say if we're going up against goblins, four portable holes are not going to do it. So we need these glass caskets on the sideboard in order to make sure that the opponent can't start building their momentum right we don't want the momentum to start building for that stuff then let's say we're facing like what what, what would you say the, the the that gruel deck that combos off of creatures coming into the battlefield hushbringer shuts that deck down flying lifelink creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger is this good in every situation or even most situations no but whenever it is essential for you to have to shut down creatures entering the battlefield triggers then you want these on your sideboard you really really do it shuts down a lot of the decks in historic completely but if it is in your main board over here the card is virtually worthless you're going to draw this worthless 90 percent of the time so people who are making sideboards and playing best of three have more appreciation for cards like the Hushbringer. I would never main deck this card ever in Historic, but 
as a sideboard piece, it is a staple in almost everything playing white. That is the power of the sideboard, and that is why we bring to bear things like the Hushbringer. It allows us to gain more control over the battlefield. It allows us to get deeper into games. So on the surface, this deck has a lot of stay power with the innovative meta tech and the Esper Sentinel drawing those cards is fantastic. But if we're matched up against something that we can't handle, like Atraxa, Metallic Rebuke, counters Atraxa. Otherwise, Atraxa deck just wins. It's either Atraxa deck just wins with a best of one scenario, or we actually have a shot in a best of three thing to come back and actually do some damage and actually get a win or two off on the opponent, depending on how often we're drawing these metallic rebukes. That is why I am a big proponent of best of three, especially with either control builds or mid-range builds. If we take this Mardu tokens deck that I built a while back into consideration for a little bit, you have your wedding announcements, welcoming vampires, um, of course your wandering emperors, the staples, the staples of the, these colors, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, Mondrake, and a Archangel of Wrath, great control piece, I really like this piece. Uh, and Reckoner Bank Busters, very, very, very common staples. But you go into these matches and what if they don't have anything with five or less power, right? This is not a fast deck. What if they come in with artifact creatures? Well, we have our sideboard here to kind of handle those situations. In the sideboard, I wanted to make sure to have duresses if they have a controlly build. Um, another cut down, unlicensed hers to get rid of graveyard stuff liliana of the veil in case they have artifact creatures and stuff like that shieldred's edict in case they have planeswalkers which this shieldred's edict will hit lord of the third path of course is going after uh, artifacts as well and a couple depopulates and a couple farewells which could also exile graveyards if you haven't noticed this was i built this deck in the uh, peak of whenever people were using graveyards like every single match it was all over youtube it was all over the arena it was everywhere so i built this deck in a response to that and it kind of shut down all of those graveyard shenanigans that we were seeing from opponents for a long time and i really appreciated this deck but i i would definitely do things differently with this now <laughs> that I, I that that stuff has calmed down and we have moved on from that era in the arena but that just goes to show that this deck is much better in best of three than it is in best of one. In best of one, any kind of board wipe is going to just tear us apart. Any kind of graveyard decks are just going to tear us apart with this particular build. But the sideboard handles most of those things fairly effectively and that's what this was meant to do make sure that artifacts and graveyard shenanigans can't happen and um, then just try to get better and better tokens on the field. This deck did really well back when I was playing it. I haven't played it for a while. It would probably have to change a little bit because meta has changed since this deck came out. Also, and this is just a note off to the side, right? If you're playing best of one and you get mana screwed, you lose. If you're playing best of one and you flood, you lose. If you're playing best of three, you have another shot. What are the chances that you get flooded or screwed three times in a row and your opponent just has wonderful draws all the way throughout that stuff? It's next to non-existent on the odds. And that is super important to remember, especially if you're worried about rank at all. If you are worried about rank and you're flooding all the time or getting mana screwed and getting pushed out of matches, and this could happen seven or eight times in a row. I've had that happen playing best of one. In best of three, it rarely ever happens that every single match or two of the three matches, I'm just screwed. It happens. It does. It will always happen in uh, Magic the Gathering, but the chances of it are greatly diminished. Whereas in best of one, your chances are, shall we say 40%, 50%. And each time you draw a new hand, 40% of the time it's gonna be garbage. 60% of the time it's gonna be playable. So it gives you more of a chance to see more cards, to see more lands. And that takes us to our topper 
for this video, which is that a lot of the time when you're going into something and we know the slivers are not good. Just recently, I went into a historic event and went up against slivers where they actually absolutely demolished me in the first round. Um, absolutely 100% demolished me, but I had enough things in the sideboard to make slivers terrible, absolutely abysmally bad. Which means that a lot of the decks that you see that are kind of meme -y, like Slivers are a meme -y deck, uh, and they're good if you don't expect them, but once you do expect them, they're no longer good. If you are playing in ranked and you don't expect somebody to bring a deck like this into it, and you lose, you're going to feel really bad. And then... You have to, at the end of that round, you have to forget everything that you knew about that deck because that player is going on to the next match, as will you, unless you just rage quit and leave. And then let's say you face a another kind of deck. Maybe you're looking at this deck right here, and this is your next match. Well, you go in, and then they... Gain control of your creature, swing with it, sack it, and deal three damage to your face, and you die. Another meme just beats you. And that's a real feels bad moment. This could happen over and over and over again without your ability to react. But in best of three, and the real reason why I play best of three is I don't have to 100% know what the opponent is playing in their first round. In fact, the first round, a lot of times, I'm just trying to feel the opponent out. I'm gonna make some awkward moves in the first round. Like, we might run into some Make This Appears, right? We might run out and invasion of New Phyrexia with um, not a whole lot of support to actually flip it into Teferi. We might be making those awkward plays because we want our opponent to be off guard. We also just want to know what the opponent has in their deck. Of course, we're still trying to win that first game because if you win the first game, the pressure is on your opponent. But the first game does allow you to get an understanding of what they're doing and why they're doing it. And then between rounds, be able to go through and get the tools like destroy evil to get rid of Shieldreds, both of the Shieldreds now, uh, Mondrakes and stuff like that, Fateful Absences to get rid of Planeswalkers, Negates, Essence Scatters, the uh, Essence Scatters specifically for Atraxa, Lord of the Third Path to get rid of the crazy artifacts that are coming around. All of this stuff really allows you to observe your opponent, see what they are playing, and then pull it back around in game two and three, pull the tools that you need to make the deck effective into your deck, and then go for round two with a better understanding of their deck. And let me tell you, whenever you're playing best of three, the first round, well, um, you don't know anything about your opponent's deck. They don't know anything about yours. It's if you play well over 50% of the time, you're going to win. If you play poorly or you face a bad matchup, yeah, maybe 50%, maybe 40% win rate. But you always have that sideboard to pick up the slack in the places where you went wrong. And I love that about best of three because getting surprised by a card or a deck can significantly weaken your win rate and on arena your ability to win your ability to win often more often than you lose is highly encouraged by wizards of the coast because of different events that are on and this is true in real life as well whenever you go to events you get more awards for the more wins that you get and it is the same on arena now let's top things off and look at let's say the events i i actually would say something differently about uh drafting and that's for a different video. We don't have time to get into that, 
But if you look at the historic event, this one makes you go until you've lost three rounds. Seven wins and three losses, that's a big ask, especially in best of one. And the reason I say that is you get a surprise deck that you just cannot handle and you don't have a sideboard to go get that one card you need in order to win. Well, you just lost the first round. Then if that happens two more times before you win seven, they're asking for a 70% win rate. Actually, a little bit more than that, more like a 77% win rate because you get your third loss, you're done, right? They're asking for a 70% win rate to get here. Now, let's go over to the traditional historic event, and I'm going to say something that's probably controversial here, but I think it is much easier to do this, to get this. And I'm going to tell you why. So you go in to the first round. You lose one, you win two. You lose one, you win two. You lose one, you win two. You would already be out in um, the standard draft or the uh, best of one draft. You would be already out. Well, this is not a draft. This is a historic event. But you would already be dead. And you wouldn't actually probably have the opportunity to reach out and grab those wins anyway. If you lose a first round here and it moves you on to the next one, you lose the first round here, and then you move on to the next one, and you lose the first round here, in the best of one thing, you're already dead. But let's say you lose the first round and then win the next two because you had that perfect piece on the sideboard. And then same here, you lose the first round and you win the next two. And you lose the first round and you win the next two. You're still going. You're still going, you're still moving through the event and you have a much higher probability of actually taking some of those wins. And we're just gonna wrap up what we kind of talked about, which is first off, best of one, if you're trying to smash your opponent fast, if you're trying to just surprise your opponent with a deck that they weren't expecting, best of one is the best place to do that. If you're trying to increase your win rate overall, Best of three is the best place to do that because it gives you a, more of an opportunity to use your sideboard to great effect. And then number three, because of the increased win rate, you'll be able to participate in events a lot more, um, what would you call it, consistently? Sure, we're going to go with consistently. Um, you're you're, you're going to be able to participate in this stuff and not lose nearly as often as you could in best of one, where you could just literally just be burning your currency, man. You really can. But <clears throat> in best of three, it at least gives you the option if you have built your sideboard right. Again, that could be another video. But it allows you the option to actually win. I hope this video was helpful. If I did miss something, please put it down below. If you disagree, please put it down below and we could have an open debate on this thing because I know there's going to be a lot of people that think best of one is the right way. That's just not me. That's just not my play style. I prefer to have more control over my win rate than the luck that needs to happen whenever you're playing best of one. I don't leave much up to luck, even in my personal life. So if we're trying to build our economy, why would I try to rely on luck on this? I don't do it in real life. I'm not going to do it here that often. And I know that there's going to be people that disagree. They're like, coffee step. That's totally untrue. Best of one is more skill based than best of three or vice versa. You know, whatever you think is true, put it down below and we'll open a debate because guess what? Magic the Gathering is a game and there is no one right way to play. But this is personally what I think about the differences between best of one and best of three. Thank you for watching today. Make sure that you've liked the video and subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time in the arena. Bye.